Okay, good. Good afternoon. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started this um, celebration. Um, this is uh, an inaugural lecture for a good friend and colleague, but it's primarily a celebration. This is uh, his chief, the title of professor. We congratulate him, we celebrate with him. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, it doesn't matter what he says to us in the lecture. Well, it kind of matters, but it doesn't matter greatly. It is an occasion to celebrate, Greg, uh, your inaugural lecture. My name is Ricardo Martinez Botas. I'm the deputy head of the department here in mechanical engineering. And before I kick off, I need to read some briefing notes. So in the case of an emergency fire alarm, you will hear it. You, will leave, you can leave through the doors. There's four doors. Leave the lecture room. And uh, make your way to the um, exhibition road. The meeting point is the corner of Exhibition Road and Imperial College. And that's literally, I think, that corner, if my bearing is right. So come out of the building, turn right, and in that corner of the college, that's where we have our, we congregate um, in the case of a fire alarm. The, this event is recorded, so that you should know that. And if there are questions online, please ask online, because we have somebody who's reading them and will read them out to us. So I welcome you here physically. Great to see so many, and also those online. So welcome you wherever you're watching this event. So as I said earlier, it's a celebration of Greg, and I just wanted to make a few, a few remarks. I mean, Greg came in 2012 to this department, and um, he, he became lecturer in 2013. I mean, that's just merely 10 years from being a lecturer through the ranks to become full professor. So that in itself says something about him. Um, he, uh, at the time of joining, I, I was in conversation. Is it strategically important for this department to work in electrochemical storage? But there would be nobody, I hope, would question that statement today. Because even in the last 10 years, it has surprised me. It has surprised me the acceleration of electrochemical storage, batteries, etc., uh, into the marketplace and just transforming transport, hopefully uh, not in the, in, in the distant future, hopefully sooner that is happening. So, so clearly it was a strategically good decision for us. I hope it's a good decision for Greg. Um, I believe it was. Um, now that group uh, went from just a few people, I mean he came himself with a few PhDs who stayed in a different engineering department, and you know it's, it's flourished, it's grown to about 30 people today, uh, it's grown in, in, in both facilities, knowledge, and translation. So we're immensely proud to have you in the department, Greg. Um, but let's go back a few years. So Greg came to Imperial College and read chemistry, believe it or not, in 1997. He did his first degree here at the college. And then he, I guess he wasn't sure what he was going to be doing. So he joined a management consultancy and joined Deloitte for just uh, over a year, so uh, that's, that's all that it took for him to re rethink. Uh, and he, uh, I guess he came back wanting to do research. So he did a PhD, again in the same department, in chemistry, in electrochemistry. So that was the introduction to electrochemistry, much of what you've been doing for at least well over a decade. Then his PhD, and then, of course, finished the PhD, and perhaps he saw the second light. The first light is to come back and do research. The second light is he joined an engineering department. Well done. And he joined the Earth Sciences and Engineering Department um, in 2000 and, got to get that right, 2006. And then he uh, did research there, postdoctoral research. He won a policy fellowship, um, which a prestigious policy fellowship. And he spent time advising government and parliament on energy matters. Was involved in the 2050 calculator, a really significant step in predicting future emissions. And then he, um, he came, back and, came back and joined uh, McKench at the time. So I think Greg really uh, epitomizes um, interdisciplinary research. I said that very poorly. You know, it's at the interface of disciplines. I mean, really, chemistry, engineering, and I think application is at the heart, at your heart. Yes, it does start from, from, from science, to delivery of devices, machines, and knowledge, and actually application of, of bits and pieces in electrochemical 
systems degradation, life estimation uh, of all those systems, cap supercapacitors, batteries, and fuel cells. So these are the plethora of the stuff that he's been doing in the last many, many years. So with that, I just want to say, as a, as a friend and as a colleague, congratulations. Um, we look forward to hearing your, your inaugural. Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, it is true. I, I did make the right move moving to engineering. Um, never regretted it. And mechanical engineering has been a fantastic home for me and my group. And I cannot imagine being in any other department. Um, mechanical engineers, I've sort of specialized in taking mechanical engineers and then teaching them enough electrochemistry to be uh, battery and or fuel cell or other electrochemical device engineers. Um, but to start, um, why even, I can go even further back than Ricardo. So why do I do, <laughs> yeah, I, the, 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 synchron the red jacket is going to be a theme. Um, why do I do what I, what I do? So I remember... It started at around about the age of four. So Ricardo mentioned, you know, when I went and did management consultancy, what was I thinking? That was a, a brief sort of like gap in, in the consistency of my, of my thinking. I was seduced by the idea of working in the city, like so many of our undergraduates. And although that is a fantastic career move for some, for me it was not. I'd had a dream since the age of four um, where I'd been brought up being taught about things like acid rain and global warming, and these affected me deeply when I was young. So I'd always wanted to be part of the solution and to make a difference. And that was consistent throughout, and then, yep, a few years in the middle when I thought, you know, I could do something else, and I realized very quickly that 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 was not the path that I should be taking. And so, I, yes, I came back and I did a PhD. I had to persuade um, my old, PhD, my old um, final year project supervisor, uh, then Dr. Now Professor Anthony Kusanak in chemistry, um, that even though I hadn't been the, hard work, the hardest working final year project student that he'd ever had, um, that I would be the hardest working PhD student that he'd ever had. Thankfully, he was willing to put that trust in me and give me a second chance, and the rest is history. Um, motivations. I think, you know, although this is a celebration, and I very much appreciate so many people coming and sharing in this with me, um, becoming a professor was never my primary goal. Now, I'm not going to lie that once you're on the academic career path, that becoming a professor isn't attractive. You know, it's, it's a goal and it's a shiny goal that, that is sort of the pinnacle of that stage of your career. Um, but if I hadn't ever made professor, but I had achieved everything else in terms of being, you know, having helped solve some of the world's biggest problems, then I would have been happy. So it's solving the problems that come first and becoming a professor and other accolades that come second. And the other thing that, you know, I, I realized when I was coming back to do my PhD was that I had too many ideas in my head, and I couldn't solve all of those, you know, I had ideas to solve problems, and I, I didn't have enough time to be able to do all of it myself. So I knew I needed to be part of a team, and I wanted to lead a team. So when I came back to do a PhD, at that point, it was absolutely clear to me the career path um, that I was on. And advice to those of you in the audience who are young and maybe starting out on your careers, um, even if you get it wrong, like I did, you know, I picked management consulting and then realized I did it wrong. Um, the, the, the idea of having something and aiming for it is so much stronger than just, you know, doing whatever comes your way. Um, so you have a plan and then every time something comes your way, you think, okay, is this going to increase or decrease the chances of this plan coming to fruition? And it means that your decisions start to accumulate and add on top of each other and increase your chances of success. 
And I will come back to this theme a bit later, about halfway through. So is there some modifications we need to do to this? Or is it just every time I... Yeah. Thank you. Um, so working with people has, you know, is, is also one of the most important things to me. Um, working with great people and also working with people not like me. So Ricardo mentioned interdisciplinary. You know, I, I'm a chemist, but I moved to engineering and people in my group come from many other types of disciplines. Um, so back to sort of like, why do I do from a scientific point of view? Um, we all know about climate change. I'm not going to go into global warming. You know, we'll accept that as a fact. Um, and then there's some other facts that people like to move. And there's something called the sort of constant travel time theorem, which says that everybody is prepared to spend, on average, about an hour a day uh, traveling. Um, and it doesn't matter where you live, where you are, how rich or poor. Um, that just determines how you travel. Um, so if you think that no matter how rich we are, we still only have 24 hours in the day, and roughly speaking, the sleep rate of it, we're prepared to spend you know, between 5 and 10% of our time traveling. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. We want to be doing other things. Um, and so as people around the world are getting wealthier and their lives are getting better, and that is exactly how it should be, that trend should continue, the modes of transport, um, people have access to faster modes of transport. And so the number of miles that people travel in a day is increasing. And it is going to, or it should continue to increase. You know, we don't want to hold back development in those regions of the world where they are developing, you know, where they need to develop and improve their quality of life. So, you know, if this graph is going to continue and we're sort of here, we cannot afford to be burning three times as much fossil fuels as we are now. You know, the consequences on the environment on our world will be absolutely catastrophic. Um, so there has to be something different. So this slide's sort of out of sync. I'll just skip this one. Um, so Ricardo mentioned I spent some time working in government. It was around about 2009, 2010. I'd done my PhD in fuel cells. I'd done my postdoc under Professor Nigel Brandon in solid oxide fuel cells, um, and I then worked in government. And at the time, um, a good friend of mine, Dave Harry, who's in the audience, he and I were having discussions, and he was trying to persuade me that batteries were going to be important, um, and that there were, you know, problems in everybody driving hydrogen fuel cell vehicles around. And, you know, we had some good, robust conversations. Um, and then I spent some time in government and I worked on this report. And what this report taught me first, before it then taught others, is that electrification was absolutely essential. It would be impossible to meet the emissions reduction targets for the UK without electrifying transport. And it would be three times harder if you electrified transport through using hydrogen. So it would be significantly easier with battery electric vehicles. Um, around about the same time, um, I wrote, uh, along with Dave and another few colleagues, Ralph Clegg and Marcello, um, uh, sort of three papers in a series which were trying to give a, a balanced view. So at the time, I was sort of like voting for fuel cells and Dave was voting for batteries and we wrote these papers together along with a couple of other colleagues where we were basically comparing and contrasting and trying to... Um, put some evidence into what at the time were some very emotional arguments being made by people in the industry and academia. Um, and we came up with this, and at the time, I still thought that these th three things would happen together and that we'd see advanced biofuels, um, you know, growing. They, they, they sort of, you know, we, we reach a limit with them that they start interfering with food supply and other issues, so they can't really grow to become a third of, of all transport fuels. Hydrogen has this problem of inefficiency. Hydrogen is still going to be important, by the way, but ultimately that middle bit is likely to represent, you know, about 90, 80 to 90% of the market moving forward. So my view has changed very considerably 
since I wrote this paper over 10 years ago. And I think that's really important to mention how people's views can and should change. You know, we live in, an, we, live in we, we often live in echo chambers. You know, I was in an echo chamber back then and we were bouncing ideas off each other and just hearing our own voices, um, you know, coming back to each other. And as new evidence comes, as scientists, as engineers, we have to change our opinion uh, in, if new evidence comes and disproves our existing position. Um, and that is essential. You know, if, if you don't change your opinion in the light of new evidence, then you, you're not a scientist. Um, and then, you know, but I was coming to this realization a bit late to the party. Um, other people had realized this well before I had. Um, and actually, you know, the sort of the seeds of the electric vehicle revolution were actually sown by three, you know, that other people might say there's more, you know, fine, apologies if I've missed out some names, but three major companies, BMW, Tesla, and Nissan, they were at the forefront of launching electric vehicles around about 2007, 2008. So before I came to the realization, they had realized that by being first movers, they could gain competitive advantage, okay, it would cost them, just like Toyota with the um, Prius, uh, who had done it about 20 years earlier with hybrids, it took about 15 years before Toyota became profitable with the hybrids. Um, these, com these three companies had to make a similar calculation, take a similar risk, but frankly, now, they're laughing. Um, you know, they are at the forefront, forefront, their technology is some of the best, um, and the others are playing catch up. And now, if you look at, you know, follow the money, and you will see that there are, you know, we're, we're approaching trillions being invested now globally in terms of building gigafactories, building battery manufacturing plants, um, retooling vehicle assembly lines. And, you know, it became inevitable about seven or eight years ago when everybody stopped investing in building, you know, new plants that were not hybrid or electric. Um, and I remember a conversation with people at a conference, um, another good friend of mine, um, Matthias Vellas from AVL, who we run a conference together, um, and he was despairing because his company, AVL, earned a lot of money um, from, from that, and, and he was having to pivot his whole company and, and work on new technologies, which they did, you know, and he's a smart man and they did the right thing, but obviously it was painful at the time. Um, I get asked questions um, regularly, um, many by people who are just genuinely interested and some with a hidden agenda um, about the downsides of electric vehicles. And again, as a scientist, um, you have to accept the evidence and not just blindly believe in the technology that you're working on. Um, and so the criticisms for batteries, electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cells have to be acknowledged. So the two that I'll sort of highlight today, one is the, well, where does the electricity come from? Um, well, I should mention that fossil fuels produce CO2 when you burn them and also when you manufacture them and when you dig them out of the ground. And there's no way of reducing that significantly and there's no way of getting that to zero. Um, electricity has been on a downward trajectory for about 20 years now um, and in most countries and most regions around the world, this is a nature paper from uh, a couple of years ago which showed the reality that it is already significantly better in most countries and you're on a downward trajectory. The second one is recycling. Um, recycling is a harder one because actually I can't give an answer and say I can guarantee it will be all right. All I can, because of the economics. Because the batteries are being made now, and they're not gonna reach the end of their life until 10 or 15 years time. And at that point, we need recycling plants. So we, you can't persuade anybody in industry to invest in building you know, the recycling plants to be able to recycle 700 gigawatt hours per year of batteries now. You've gotta hope they'll do it in 10 or 15 years time, when those batteries reach end of life. Now. We're not daft, you know, as in we, the, you know, society, humanity, we're not daft. So the way that we ensure that's going to happen is through regulation. 
So it has to be achieved through regulation. But we are aware of this as a problem and we know it's possible, so then it's just about regulation to ensure that somebody pays for it at the time. Um, otherwise, Otherwise, I have, to answer the, I have to admit that if we, don't, if we don't have regulation that makes sure that investment happens, then we will just be trading one environmental catastrophe for another. Um, but we know how to avoid it, so we should be diligent in terms of making sure that our governments pass those regulations to ensure that we do recycle and reuse these materials. Um, so I'm now just going to... Um, talk about people. Um, I mentioned that when I was doing my PhD, I'd already identified that I wanted to be an academic and I wanted to work with lots of people and surround myself with people who hopefully many of them are going to be smarter than me. Um, and this is what we've done. So, you know, we collaborate with people from all over the world, um, not just the flags that are shown there. So, some photos just because then I can talk about people. I've picked lots of photos that hopefully should cover most of the people who've been in the group over the years, but apologies to anybody that I've missed out. It's not intentional. Um, you know, a summer barbecue, someone couldn't attend. Apologies that therefore you're not in the photo. Um, I'm also not going to mention everybody. I can't. Uh, literally hundreds of people have, have come through the group over the years if I'm including, you know, visiting researchers and undergraduates who've done their, their projects with us. Um, so I'm just going to show a few photos and talk about people and hopefully ex, you know, group members, alumni will be happy. Um, so I did my PhD in Anthony Kusnak's group. I didn't have a good photo that included Anthony, so apologies to Anthony if he's watching or watches this later. Um, but Paddy and Alice were probably the most significant influence on me in that we did our PhDs pretty much together um, all the way through and we had lots of laughs. Um, then I was a postdoc, moved over to Nigel Brandon's group, who's now head of the whole faculty of engineering. Um, had a great time in his group with lots of different people. Um, uh, I won't go through and read out and list everybody. Um, but during the time I was in Anthony's group, I got married. Um, my wife, Amy, is here in the front of the audience and will hate me for having pointed her out. Um, this was actually in uh, the Hall's residence um, so my wedding reception was in the Hawes residence just across the way because Anthony was the warden of the Hawes. This was before they were rebuilt, so this is kind of like the old building. You're looking towards Falmouth Kia through those windows. Um, so, you know, and we, most of my family and all the guests were staying in the Hawes residence that night because it was the summer, so you could rent out the rooms cheaply. Um, so it was a good night. Um, and then, you know, more from Nigel's group, more people who I have very fond memories of. And then a sort of a, a, a pivotal moment, um, which I didn't realize how significant this would be at the time. Um, when I was a postdoc in Nigel's group, I made friends with Ralph Clegg, who was a PhD student in this department, um, supervised by Fred, I think. Um, and we, you know, he was into motorsport, and had worked in Formula One teams and was a mature PhD student. And a bunch of undergraduates came to us and said, we want to work on racing cars, but we don't want to work on combustion engines. Can you help us? We want to do fuel cells. And we went, yeah, we'll help you. So we ended up, within a, to cut a very long story short, we ended up making some hydrogen fuel cell powered go-karts and going and racing them around the world. We then ended up entering Formula Student. And within a few years, I ended up running mechanical engineering department's formula student team, even though I was a chemist based in earth science engineering, which was a little bit weird. Um, but it meant that I got to know the department and the department got to know me. So it was never sort of like the plan at the time to move to mechanical engineering, but it meant that that door, you know, was starting to open so that if, 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 that, if I ever needed to step through that door, there were people who knew me and I'd sort of proven that I could achieve things. Um, then the fellowship era, what I'm showing here is just uh, that th this is, I've obscured the numbers because I'm not, I'm, I don't want to sort of like highlight, you know, the number of papers, the amount of research funding and all this. Like I said, that doesn't matter. It's solving the problems that matter. The reason I'm showing this is because of something that will happen about halfway through. So then I got a fellowship. Um, uh, Ricardo mentioned that I went and worked in government for a bit. That was plan B. 
you know, if I didn't get the EPSSC Research Fellowship, I probably would have ended up staying in government and becoming a policy person. Um, you've always got to have a backup plan because becoming an academic is very competitive. Um, around about this time, uh, baby number one came along, 2011. Um, the fellowship, a couple of years through the fellowship, um, basically became a lecturer. After I, so I moved to mechanical engineering in 2012, became a lecturer a year later. Within two years, senior lecturer. Um, baby number one had come along, then along came baby number two, and then along came baby number three during that period of time. Um, so group was growing, life was getting busy, multiple children, um, you know, life was getting busier and busier and busier. And then this happened. So this is the amount of funding that the group received, and this is what happened in one year. And the scale on here is tens of millions. So what happened was the Faraday Institution. So in the UK, the government was lobbied by a number of people from both industry and academia, included myself and also Billy, um, who, uh, who who's in the audience somewhere. Um, we were named researchers, not, not, sorry, not named researchers, named co-investigators on the uh, proposal that founded the Faraday Institution. And then, whilst I was a senior lecturer, so in, in 2017, I was nominated by the community in the UK to lead uh, a bid to run the multi-scale modeling project, which was basically one of the four starting projects for the Faraday Institution. Um, so this was involving about 21 academics from nine universities, and I was chosen by all of them to, to lead them, to manage them. I think mostly because none of, them, none of the others wanted to do it. Um, and, and I'd got a reputation of being able to sort of like manage people and sort of like cope with personalities and clashes and this kind of stuff and just um, do the diplomacy and the politics. Um, and so I was, I was chosen at an early stage of my career to, one, a win, to, to run a project that was worth 10 million, just one project, 10 million for three years. And suddenly I'd won 10 million of funding you know, as a senior lecturer to run essentially a supersized program grant. Now that does not happen to most people and it will never happen to most people. It's kind of like not a once in a lifetime opportunity because most will never have that opportunity. I was literally just in the right place at the right time. Okay, I was good enough that people chose me, but being good enough didn't mean that this would automatically happen. So you've got to both have, you know, you've both got to be good but you've got to be in the right place at the right time and have a healthy dollop of luck. You know? So this trajectory was kind of like my hard work, this sudden step change, luck. Otherwise, it, it would have just carried on and that would have still been considered successful. Um, so this I attribute to luck, being in the right place at the right time. Now, that made my life even harder. Three kids also group tripled in size in 18 months, taking a group of about 12 to a group of you know, between 30 and 40 in 18 months was extremely painful um, and very difficult. Wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> you know, grow more slowly, it's easier. A um, couple of more photos. We, we, in the group, we sort of, we, we tend to encourage social activities. I take the group away for a, a weekend every summer. We go and book out a youth hostel down in the southwest and, and we go and do canoeing and climbing and all this kind of stuff. It's great fun. So this is just where some of these photos are from. Um, these are all the group leaders from 2019. Um, and around about this time, started doing spin outs as well because I decided that my life was not busy enough. Um, <laughs> Three children managing a massive grant, you know, lots of people, um, lots of responsibility. And, but when you've got so many smart and enthusiastic and um, pas equally passionate as me people in your group that they want to make a difference, they want to do things, and they come to you and say, Greg, we've got this great idea, we want to do a spin out or a startup, then you can't say no. Um, so Cognition was the first, that was sort of like actually a spin-in, so not, you know, so founded by a good friend Tom Cleaver who, has, you know, wasn't from the university um, but wanted our help. And then Breathe, um, which I'll mention a little bit in, a little bit later, was two of my PhD students who came to me and just said, 
look, we, we think that industry is not making use of what academia does because they don't understand it. And we think if we sort of like sit at that interface, there's a business model there. Turns out they were right. Breathe has been very successful since. Um, and then COVID hit. Um, so I don't have any photos for a couple of years because basically I was just sat in my home office for a year or two talking to people on Teams um, like the rest of us. Um, and um, But this is sort of like when life resumed. There's... There's, um, and in the last year, not, not that I'm personally involved at the moment, but these two spin-outs were from the last year. So group members, um, we continue to you know, support and grow a culture where we welcome and, and support members of the group who want to do spin-outs and startups. Um, a warning at this point, I'm going to talk about some science, not just people. And... Um, going to refresh my memory. So the bits of science I'm going to talk about, there's going to be two main themes. And again, apologies to the members of the group that I don't mention. Being such an interdisciplinary group, we have sort of clusters of researchers who, different bits, who do different bits of research. Um, so for example, you know, the life cycle analysis, I'm not going to mention that today. Um, uh, the fuel cell work that we still do, I'm not going to mention that today. What I've picked is things that I can sort of distill into a story and deliver it in a few minutes. Um, so apologies to those whose papers and research I don't mention. Um, it's not any slight or not deliberate at all. Um, so what I'm going to start with is why we do modelling. So we have a philosophy um, that... I think probably Monica, sort of you and I, sort of refined from our work on the lithium sulfur project, um, where we also collaborated with Daniel, another good friend who's in the audience, um, where you know we 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 want you know we wait until a technology we, we can actually get our hands on a cell. So that's where we're different from many groups. Um, we don't work on hypothetical technologies. You know, when a company comes and says, I've made this battery, it's going to change the world, I'm like, okay, give me one. Let me test it. I will believe you when I can test it and get physical results. Um, so, you know, we, we wait, and this is why we seek out some of these other startups from other universities and other places around the world, and we try and get access to these technologies. Um, so we get access to the latest, solid state, lithium sulfur, etc. Um, so we got access to some some solid state batteries and we explored them experimentally and then we try and create models that reproduce their behavior and critically you know those models we then use those models to try and solve problems and this is what ricardo mentioned about how the work i do is focused on applications you know i, I moved to engineering because i love working with engineers because they give me access to problems where the answer matters to someone and i can see my research have impact within a few years um, the philosophy that we then developed and refined working on lithium sulfur batteries um, with a, a few projects a few years ago um, was the model should be the simplest model possible that is capable of reproducing that behavior. If you have a more complicated model, then you're probably going to have problems parameterizing it. You, you won't actually, you know, you'll, you'll basically have an overfitting problem or an underfitting problem where you can't actually know for sure that that model is fitted correctly to the data. Whereas if you know that this is the simplest model possible, um, then you know, you've probably got the same number of degrees of freedom in your model as you have observable in the data. Um, so that's our philosophy. We also then, this was the start of the group embracing the open source philosophy, which has been around for a long time. Um, again, we're not an early adopter, we, we, you know, but this was the point in time where we, the first paper where we made the code available um, for others to further develop, which is a really important thing to do. Um, because we're supposed to build upon other people's research. Well, if we can't reproduce other people's research or others can't reproduce ours, then we're not building upon each other's research. And it holds back entire fields, entire disciplines. Um, so, you know, the battery community is slowly moving in this direction and we're, you know, we're co trying to contribute towards that and it does make a difference. Um, and then the theme that I'm now going to go into is like once we've got those models, well, we, we, we're looking for experimentally observed phenomena and then we're going to try and build models to explain them. 
at an early stage in the group when we'd sort of like uh, within a couple of years after sort of transitioning from only working on fuel cells to beginning to work on batteries, uh, which was around about the time I moved to mechanical engineering, um, we were publishing some papers talking about the importance of understanding thermal gradients on lithium ion batteries. So basically, any battery, when you use it, generates heat. Don't believe anybody who tells you it doesn't, um, and there are some who do. Um, they'll always generate heat because of the laws of thermodynamics. Um, and if they generate heat, you have to dissipate that heat. And if heat is flowing, you have a thermal gradient. That's just true. Um, and a battery under the influence of thermal gradient behaves differently from a battery that is not under the influence of a thermal gradient. And based upon what I've just said, whenever you use a battery, there is a thermal gradient. So you kind of have to know what the thermal gradient is. So this was the first paper where we showed the effect of um, thermal gradients on the performance of batteries. And surprisingly enough, even though people have been using batteries for many, many years, there was very little that had been published on this. I won't say zero, we weren't the first, but there was very little. And then within a couple of years, um, we'd expanded this experimental capability where we'd set ourselves the goal at that point in time, a strategic goal of being able to reproduce in the lab at the single cell level the boundary conditions that that cell could experience in any battery pack of any design. And we'd achieved that goal within a couple of years, which meant we had quite unique experimental capability, which was therefore quite attractive to industry. And it enabled us to actually then recreate boundary conditions that were similar to models. Um, and this paper came out, which is probably, I would say, one of the most influential sort of like turning points of the group, um, led by my, my alumni, Ian Hunt, who's doing the vote of thanks later. Um, and this really sort of like was like throwing the cat among the pigeons because this showed that the same cell cooled in different ways. This is a rate of degradation, by the way. This is a number of cycles. So we cycled these cells a thousand times and we basically showed that different ways of cooling it could change the rate of degradation by three times, which to industry was like, oh, so our cell might last three times longer or only last a third of the length it could if we design our pack wrong. Nothing to do with the cell, just how you design the battery pack. And so this message really sort of highlighted the importance because this is all driven by those thermal gradients. It's the direction of the thermal gradients. There's a YouTube video that you can go and watch um, if you want to know more. And uh, since we first launched this YouTube video, it's now had 66,000 views, which is like, you know, ne would never have believed that when we first <laughs> commissioned this video. Um, we, sorry, this is, we, we then set about modeling it. it. Took us a couple of years to be able to reproduce that effect in a model. I won't go into the detail. Um, we validated it because validation is super important as well. There's no point in having a model if you haven't actually validated it and demonstrated that it is reliable and trustworthy. So these were cells we had made for us that we then used to uh, predict, uh, compare the model to. And then because we're interested in application, we couldn't get our hands on this cell, but we made a virtual um, uh, commercially available cell, a large pouch cell that goes in uh, vehicles. I think this was, this was the cell uh, that went into the Renault Zoe, one of the earlier um, vehicles, um, electric vehicles that was commercialized. And with that virtual cell, we then started playing around with it. We started redesigning it in the model, and we demonstrated that we could open up a thermal bottleneck that would enable us to do the type of cooling that we'd recommended in our previous paper and show that this would dramatically improve the performance of this cell. So this then led, you know, following on from this, to multiple projects since then working with cell designers, um, helping them understand how to design better lithium-ion batteries. Around about the same time, I said I'd come to this. Um, I read this book, introduced to me by Tom Cleaver, who was the founder of one of those spin-outs, Cognition Energy, the first, not spin-out, startup. Um, and this book has had a significant influence on the way that I run the group since I read it. Um, it's a philosophy of management called directed opportunism. It has other names. Um, I think there's a flavor of it called agile uh, project management. Um, but the, the, the sort of like the, the truest description that I like is the directed opportunism. It basically just means have a plan, work towards that plan so that every decision you're 
given, you make a, a judgment of like, well, which, which, which decision I make is going to increase or decrease the chances of achieving this plan. And therefore, you don't have to overanalyze. You don't have to th plan too far ahead because that doesn't generally work out very well. Um, but every, if every decision you're making, you're judging against that plan, then you're increasing your chances of success every time you make a decision. And eventually, they add up over time. And if you're doing this and your competitors are not, you are far more likely to succeed than them. And it's been demonstrated in, in it originated in sort of military circles. It, it's been successfully applied in business, and we now apply it to research. The first example of the plan we came up with was like I said, around about this time where we'd been able to reproduce this result in a model and we'd been able to um, predict that we could design cells better or we believed that we could design be cells better than most people in the lithium-ion battery industry, which is pretty arrogant. Um, we then set ourselves a strategy of, um, you can summarize this as we picked ourselves the strategy to change the entire global lithium-ion battery industry to design better cells based upon what we'd learned. And we then started working towards it. Um, one of the things we identified was that the reason that, or one of the reasons why we felt cells had been designed so badly in the past from a thermal management point of view was because the lithium-ion battery industry had been competing on things like energy density and cost, which are still very important. They are probably number one and number two, but number three, thermal management, they had no way of competing because they couldn't compare. There was no comparison. So there were, we thought there was something missing on the spec sheet of a battery. So we came up with something that we called the cell cooling coefficient, which is basically just a simple measurement that tells you how good or bad a cell is in terms of how easy you can get the heat out of it. We then started um, going around and publicizing this. I won't go into how you measure it, but there's another YouTube video that you can watch that explains the cell cooling coefficient if you are interested. What we then started doing is after we'd created that strategy and we'd come up with our idea, it took us a year, just under a year, to publish the first paper. The cell redesign paper came out. We had an industry-focused article uh, go forward. We then had a nature article, which was a pretty big milestone in the group. Um, this, but again, this didn't happen by chance. This happened because a year earlier I'd been at a conference and was having tea or coffee with a nature editor. And she went, oh, what interesting research are you doing? And I went, well, I've got this strategy to change the entire global lithium-ion battery industry. And we're doing research to do that. And she was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Because you know what nature wants. They want big picture, like crazy ideas, big stuff. You know, if I just told her, like, oh, well, thermal gradients are really important in lithium-ion batteries, you know, she would have just walked away. So having that strategy meant I could take advantage of that opportunity when it arose. So it's directed opportunism. It's about being ready when the opportunities arise. And you don't know what the opportunities are going to be, but you're ready when they do. So yeah, so a nature article doesn't happen by chance. Um, we were ready when the opportunity came, and then so on and so forth, working with industry partners, now working with standards agencies to try and get this adopted and try and get this used more widely. Um, the original goal of doing it in three years, I realized, was woefully um, wrong. Um, and it's probably going to take us at least a decade or more from now um, to, you know, to continue. In time, this was when the sort of the first spin out, because cognition was a spin in. First spin out, two of my PhD students set up um, a, a spin out company, Breathe. I've already mentioned it briefly, but I just wanted to mention it again because we've achieved a huge amount of impact with this company already in terms of these are the customers that we can publicly mention who are already running our software in their products, um, which is quite a significant thing to be able to say, you know, paying money as well. Um, and there's quite a few more that we can't mention because they, they, they haven't given us permission or it's not public knowledge yet. Um, but this is about actually, you know, seeing, our res seeing my research have an impact in the real world. So that was why when Ian and Jan came to me and wanted to set up this company, I said, okay, I'm in. Because they had a vision to take not just our research, but leading research from other groups around the world, um, pick up their ideas from their papers, and then implement it and actually do it rather than just talking about it. Um, 
what are we doing next? So I'm just going to finish on what we're working on right now. The biggest problem is this, your battery lasts for many, many years, and then at some point it just goes, ugh, and dies. So we call that the knee point, the cliff edge, the rollover. It's basically when does accumulative degradation lead to end of life? How long will my battery last? That is a question that is already worth billions of dollars to industry because it affects, they either have to over-engineer their battery pack um, so that it does last longer because they don't quite, they don't know. They, they've got too large an uncertainty, an error bar on their prediction at the moment. So they have to over-engineer. Well, if you've got a battery pack that costs you $10,000 and you need to make it 10% bigger, you're over-engineering by $1,000. You know, multiply that by the number of vehicles you sell and that's a large amount of money. Or you take a risk, you don't over-engineer and you hope that you meet your warranty. Well, what about if you don't? It's going to cost you a lot of money. Um, and in the future, within a decade, this question's probably going to be costing industry trillions, not billions anymore, because of the volumes of vehicles that are already being sold and will be reaching end of life, and the volumes they'll be selling in 10 years' time will be an order of magnitude than they are now. So, answering this question is probably one of, well, it's, it's one of the biggest questions to solve, and it's probably one of the most valuable. And, you know, we set ourselves this as a, as a new goal um, a year after the, um, the thermal management goal. So this has been one of our strategies since then. So what did we do? We started off by trying to understand the problem. There's been lots of papers published on degradation. We did a review led by a colleague of mine who can't be here today, Jacqueline, um, and about 20 other co-authors, basically about half the team, uh, who each were given one degradation mechanism to review and read hundreds of papers. So together as a group, we could read thousands of papers that one person on their own could never have done. And distill that down into a single diagram, which we know is wrong. You know, we didn't capture everything and some of the arrows aren't there and some things have changed as we've learned more. But it gave us a map, it gave us a starting point that we could start to fill in. And then we... Uh, within the Faraday Institution, the Multiscale Modeling Project, this gave me access to re the resources of an entire community, not just my whole group. So full credit to the guys at University of Oxford who created PIBAM. Um, it, they were already sort of like working on it before Faraday Institution Multiscale Modeling came along, but we came along and adopted it and uh, basically uh, gave them lots of money to help make it real. Um, but it was a decision at the beginning of that project of like, should, should multi-scale modeling embrace this and support it? And the answer was yes. And the rest is history. That, that decision definitely has proven to be great. Um, PIBAM was created. Um, in my research group, we've now basically pivoted entirely. It's, it's the main thing we use. And all of our work is going on adding functionality, adding degradation mechanisms into PIBAM which is this, uh, actually I should mention, it's just recently been uh, adopted by NumFocus, which is a US charitable institution that exists purely to support the development of open source um, software. And you will find that some, most of the things that NumFocus have supported, you know, any of you who are into coding will recognize many of them as being very significant, um, uh, having a very significant effect on the areas that they were growing from. So we're really hopeful that this is going to pitch us from sort of like growing slowly organically to growing exponentially in terms of a community of people working together. So what have we been doing? We've been adding mechanisms into PIBAM. We've been coupling them together, which is one of the hardest things to do because you can design an experiment to age a battery in one way and then try and fit one degradation mechanism to it. And that's kind of like done a lot in the literature. But coupling them together and understanding the interactions where you have multiple positive or negative feedback mechanisms, everything's interrelated, everything affects each other. Oh, and everything's affected by thermal gradients as well, don't forget them. Um, so we've been working on putting all of these together and then this is the, sort of the first example of a model where the model is the same. The model has four degradation mechanisms coupled together. The model is identical, same parameters, same virtual cell. And now we just use the cell in different ways. 
So we run different ways of using that battery and we can predict different rates of degradation, which was quite, um, quite exciting. So if we look at what we've already implemented in that first paper led by Simon, who's in the audience, um, these were the four mechanisms that we've implemented. That's kind of like a consequence. These ones are sort of not explicitly represented, but you can imagine that they are consequences of these ones as well. So four primary mechanisms. We didn't quite have time to do the fifth primary one for the first paper. In terms of what then else are we working on, we're working on the other primary one, the cathode decomposition. I won't go into the science of this, but the links there to the papers are there. Um, we're working on upgrading lithium plating because that's super important. Um, if you fast charge, which is what industry really wants to do, fast charging batteries, um, or you want to charge when cold, which many of you will appreciate, will, will have been quite important the last couple of weeks in this country. Um, we've been working on upgrading lithium plating. Um, we've also been working on understanding um, new battery chemistries. People are adding silicon to their batteries to add, in, to increase the energy density, to add range. Um, so this is where we have to add quite some quite complicated physics of actual uh, phase changes and crystallization and alloying of lithium and silicon. Um, we did we we did a uh, experimental study. Uh, led by Neil um, on a commercial cell and we proved experimentally that some of our theories of how silicon behave are correct um, and then guess what next we're reproducing this in a model uh, and then there's an, another degradation mechanism which is a well-known sort of like end-of-life consequence that in some cells depending upon how they're made if they don't have the right uh, amount of solvent or electrolytes, then eventually they dry out and entire regions of electrodes stop working because there's not enough solvent in there. Um, so one of my PhD students, Ray Ho, who's sitting in the front row and is actually going to be doing the online questions later, um, has been doing this work. So we've been working on adding these degradation mechanisms and you can see those are the four I've mentioned that we're adding sort of in the next, you know, as in, we've already published the papers on the underlying individual degradation mechanism, but it's coupling them together and adding them to that library so that we can then, you know, in the near future, run simulations where we've got eight degradation mechanisms running simultaneously, which is, yeah, it's not going to be easy, but we will get there. Um, and once we've done that, we'll keep going. So the goal is, you know, end of this decade, there should be tools that industry can use that will have been, that we will have made a significant contribution to some other really excellent research groups around the world are clearly working towards the same goal as well um, and wherever possible we we collaborate with them um, but by the end of this decade you know if industry doesn't have these tools then the electrification you know trajectory is 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 going to slow down and we won't actually um, be able to make vehicles cheap enough for everybody in the world to enjoy the benefits um, so the future this is kind of like a cliche as old as time, but it's still true. You know, what, what kind of world do we want to leave to our children or our grandchildren? Um, uh, someone once said to me, I can't remember who, they asked me the question. They said, okay, when you're deciding what you should do with your life, think about what you would be proud of when you've retired and your grandchildren come and say, granddad, what did you do when you were younger? Or, you know, to make it quite relevant, you know, they might be... Um, suffering some of the consequences of climate change because we're certainly not going to avoid all of the consequences as, as societies. They might be saying, Granda, did you do anything? You know, what did you do to help solve this problem? And, you know, I like to think that everybody in our group has, has you know, will be able to say that they, have, that they did something and it was significant. Um, so we haven't solved the problem yet. We need to carry on. Um, and basically, we need to plateau this off and then bring it down again um, as, as a society. Clearly, we're just doing one bit. We're making the batteries. We're still working on the fuel cells because they're still going to be important. Um, other members of the international community are working on the electricity generation and solving other parts of this big spider web of our economy. Um, funding acknowledgements, these are the three main funders of the group in terms of public funds uh, from the government. Uh, there's a plethora of industry partners that we've worked with and have provided funding over the years. Um, I haven't put all their logos up because uh, it would have been too difficult to ask for all their permission 
and putting them all on one slide might have upset one and not the other and it was just too complicated. So, um, so the people we work with in industry know who they are and thank you so much. Um, it wouldn't be so interesting without you, but yeah, the majority of our funding from the government comes from these guys. And thank you, thank you for sitting through this lecture and listening. Okay, so we've got time for questions. So there'll be uh, some questions. So I'm going to take these two first, but they will, and then come back online if there are any questions you let me know. So we'll take two questions first. Yes. <coughs> Microphones. I was yes. interested in your options a few years ago, the different forms of energy. I've considered a fourth, which involves a lot of investment initially, but long term could help to relieve the pressure on batteries, especially for heavy vehicles, lorries, buses, and one things like that. Uh, you had the trolley bus since the 1880s, and we've had these experiments in Sweden, other places with electrified roads and motorways. We have it with railways. Why not use overhead electric uh, to take the load for heavier loads and longer distances instead of hydrogen? And then the battery is only working in town or local yeah, roads. I, I yeah, think, I think that's a very good option. There are significant... This is why I keep mentioning fuel cells are probably still going to be important because there's significant parts of the transport system that are very hard to electrify with batteries in the vehicle. And you've mentioned a few of them. Um, you can either do it with a chemical fuel, um, which could be hydrogen, but hydrogen has problems as that volumetrically it's, you know, it's not very efficient to store. It takes up a lot of space. Um, and then likewise, you can electrify transport without having to have the battery on the vehicle. Um, in the ways that you mentioned. Um, so yeah, as an engineering solution, I think that's great. It requires, um, you know, it needs to be on trunk roads where you've got the, you'll, you'll have the return on investment for the high capital cost of the infrastructure. Um, but in countries that are prepared to do that, um, it's a great idea. Yeah, the reason I raise it is because hydrogen has uh, the problems of safety. We think of the Hindenburg. Yeah. Uh, overhead electric is a tried and tested technology. It's worked for over 140 years. And it works on railways. So you, uh, you don't have to persuade me. You need to persuade the investors. And the other thing is <laughs> titanium. Are they using titanium now instead of copper? So to reduce the cost of the overhead fixed equipment as well. So I couldn't comment on that. Not my area of research. Let's just want to throw that yeah. in anyway. Thank yeah. you. Let's go okay. here, here next. Daniel. We need a microphone. Yes, coming down. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Other side. Yeah, just here. Thank you. Hi, Greg. Thank you very much for, for a, as expected, fantastic talk. Now, I've got a, a question which relates to some of the work you did when you were with the, the government, DECC. And really, it's... Um, and this question comes from somebody who's very much on the bus, not somebody who thinks it's yeah. wrong. Um, there are some very ambitious targets of net zero and some very ambitious time frames, and you often find them in local government organisations, so um, planning to go net zero by 2030. Um, what's your perspective on both the achievability of things like that and also the necessity? Um, I mean, the necessity, the more the better, um, you know, and we do need pioneers, early adopters to try and go um, <coughs> net zero as quickly and early as possible to basically, so that everyone else can learn from their mistakes. <laughs> so, so I would say we need those pioneers. Um, so I would say go ahead to, 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 to anyone who, who's in a position of responsibility and trying to do that. Um, I would say, you know, in certain things it's possible in the short term. You know, if you are just responsible for a local area and it's like, you know, heating buildings and powering vehicles and these kind of things, well, we can do that with existing technologies that are already adopting mass scale. So at a local level, you can probably do that. Unless you're a local authority who's got a cement plant or something that's really hard to clean up on your doorstep. And when, we were, when I was in deck and we were looking at the, the country, well, we were like, okay, well, unless we destroy that industry, we're going to have to think of a way to clean up that industry, and it's not so easy. Um, so this is why, yes, locally, if the, if the 
if the context is right, you can imagine that a local authority could achieve net zero by 2030 with existing technologies. But at a national level, it's a lot harder because you've got these critical industries, cement manufacturer, steel manufacturer, etc., that are really tough. Thank you. Any online questions? Otherwise, yeah, maybe. Yeah. No. Okay, so we'll go here. Yes. Hi. Um, you make the point about the vast investments being made in, in battery production. How much does that lock in a particular kind of even lithium technology? Like, you know, can you take, I have no idea, your, your gigafactory as you build it today and say, ah, we are going to put a bit of silicon in? How, yeah, you, you get the idea. Yeah, yeah. So it, it does lock in certain decisions. You're right. I mean, you don't you make that factory and you want to run it for 15 years. Um, you know, the first seven or eight years is to pay back the investment, and then the rest. You know, and then and then you want to run it so you actually make some profit. Um, so you so the automotive industry and many other industries are therefore have to be conservative because otherwise they undermine their very business model and they go out of business. Um, so you will be, yeah, they will be locked into um, form factors. You know, they've got a roll-to-roll a -roll sort of like coating technology, so you can't just say, well, I've got this fantastic new battery, but I've got to use sputtering, you know, because you can't change the way that the cells are made at that fundamental level. Now, if you've got a different powder, you can come along and go, okay, well, I can still use all of the same equipment. I just want you to pour this powder into the beginning rather than this powder. You might think that's okay. But actually, if you change the chemistry of the cell, um, you know, a company like, you know, VW is not going to take a cell, you know, they're, they're going to want years of data of that chemistry, you know, because their model of lifetime and performance is going to be based upon years of data. So you can't just come along and say, I've got this better powder, chuck it in, can you use that cell on your production line tomorrow? They'll be like, oh, no, hang on, wait, you know, there's a, there's a procedure for doing this, and it's about seven or eight years long. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, we, we are, th that money being invested now is locking us into certain technologies. You know, people talk a lot about new technologies, solid state batteries, Anyone who's a big proponent of solid state batteries, apologies, you're not gonna like this. Um, but it isn't gonna be the next big thing in the next decade, because at the moment, all the money's going into the incumbent uh, solvent-based lithium-ion batteries, um, and they're gonna be dirt cheap. You know, solid state batteries are gonna take 10 years to, commit, to be, reach any kind of scale where they are even a drop in the ocean, and at that point, they're gonna be having to displace this technology that's really well understood mass-produced, really cheap, um, it'll be really hard. It'll be really hard for them to break in. Great, thank you. We'll take one of the online questions, and then I'll come back to you, and maybe I'll take your question, and that will, will complete. Um, please. You know, so they'll have to be significantly better in some way in order to succeed, which are mostly what they're aiming for. Okay, so you can read it out to us. So. Yeah, there was one question about the charging time. So one key thing is for to replace vehicles with internal combustion engine is to match the charge time. And Cam Online just want you to comment on the charging time of batteries and how far it is still away. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really important for some customers. Um, once you have an electric vehicle and you drive it, you realize that the way that you use a vehicle is quite different from how you think you use a vehicle. Um, uh, most of us drive, you know, most days that we drive a vehicle, we drive short distances. And so overnight charging, when you can sign up for a contract and get cheap electricity, um, is how, you know, is the majority of how most people will charge their vehicles. But then, occasionally, you want to do a long journey. Um, some people, okay, use their vehicles and want to do a long journey every day. Um, and for those people, whether it's occasional or regular, fast charging does have its benefits. You know, if you can get your charging time down to 30 minutes, you know, you might be okay with a coffee break, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. Um, so this is the goal of a lot of industry. So one of the problems is actually, one of the biggest problems is cells get hot and overheat. 
So actually, a lot of the industry is realizing that it is the thermal bottleneck that is now coming back to bite them. Um, and that is one of the major challenges. The other one is lithium plating. Um, so, you know, you've, and, and that requires, um, you know, good models that can predict what's going on inside the cell, even though you can't measure it and even though, you know, it's not directly observable. Um, so there's a lot of research being done on that because we know, you know, the community and the industry knows that some customers will demand that performance. Okay, we're going to take just one more question here. I think there was a question. Yeah, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this nice talk, Greg. Just following up a little bit maybe with that question. So I recall coming across a paper motivating research on all solid state batteries claiming that conventional lithium ion batteries were close to the theoretical limits in terms of power density, energy density, and that therefore, yeah, we had to do research on all solid state. So I, I wonder if you had any comments on what are those theoretical limits, how far we are from there, and what yeah. do we do once we reach them? I guess we can always keep busy ourselves with yeah. degradation. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, you're right. So um, most would agree that, you know, we're, we're approaching or if, or we're, you know, or we're already in the foothills of the law of diminishing returns. That in terms of trying to get more energy density out of the incumbent lithium ion sort of organic solvent based technology, um, we're, we can't just keep on going up and up and up. Um, so, so yes, on that measure, you know, that because, but, but the cost, we can keep driving down. We, you know, I don't think anyone thinks we're, all, we're plateauing in terms of the cost. Um, so, you know, so these new technologies that are coming, they have to be better in some way, and that is one way in which they're, they're guaranteed to be better. So it's, it's making sure, you know, so if you want to be successful with these new technologies, it's finding the niches where that matters more than the cost, you know, so that you can grow the technology, achieve the volumes, um, get into the mass production where the costs begin to come down, and then you can start to compete with the incumbent. So we know what the pathway is, but it's not as simple as just going, oh, this technology is better, therefore it's going to win. It's like, no, the economics matter as well. Thank you. So we will probably close the questions there. Thank you, Greg. For that. Okay, I call upon Dr. Ian Hunt, who is the CEO of Beacon Battery Design, and he's going to give the vote of thanks. Please, Ian. Hi, everyone. Just before I start, I've just got to say that Greg and I didn't coordinate our outfits today. Um, perhaps, perhaps we should have done. Um, thanks, Greg, for uh, just an excellent lecture. Um, I think the thing that struck me most was how you apply fundamental science to solve real-world problems. And as engineers, it's something we should all be aspiring to do. Um, I, when I prepared for this, I, I realized I've known you for nearly 15 years um, when I was a slightly disreputable, perpetually hungover undergraduate, and you were slightly less disreputable, sometimes hungover postdoc. Um, and so we tried to prevent ourselves getting electrocuted from the former student car we were making. It was clear back then that Greg was going places, and I'm thrilled but not surprised to be here celebrating with Greg on his professorship. Um, Greg quickly got a fellowship and and, and his lecturing post, uh, and I was lucky enough to be one of Greg's first PhD students in this department. Um, really lucky to watch the group grow, both in terms of the size of the lab, the number of people in the group, but also the quality and the quantity of the research produced, and obviously it's gone from strength to strength in the, in the intervening years. Um, I spent the last few years of my career in industry, and it's clear from that perspective the influence that Greg's work has had on uh, well, battery pack design. Um, and I think the thing that's most important that's come out of the group is the importance of designing cells, your thermal management system, your BMS, and ultimately your whole pack as a single system to truly optimize that system performance. On the surface, it might sound obvious, but actually part of that reason is because Greg's been telling everyone that for 10 years and producing the models and the experiments to prove it. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that the design of EVs on our roads have been influenced by the work coming out of Greg's group. Um, Greg mentioned earlier that one of his, his aspirations is to turn engineers into electrochemists. Um, he failed with me. Um, but it's one of the, the, the most exciting reasons for working in Greg's group is that cross-curricular sort of application of, of, and different people that you get to work with. 
but it's not just that. Greg's an excellent mentor, um, an excellent counsellor and therapist at times, and, and, a, and a great friend. He's also really fun on a night out, but those stories will remain for, for later. Um, you can see some of the impact Greg's had by, by the alumni from the group. Um, he talked about his spin-outs, but there's also people uh, from Greg's group all over Imperial College, other academics in, in different universities across the country and the world, but also into industry as well. The head of research at RIMAC, the head of battery cells at BMW, and until recently the head of cell design at British Fault, which was me. Um, <laughs> Um, i just uh, just going to finish by congratulating Greg again uh, on his professorship. It's, it's fully deserved. And I know I'm not alone in really looking forward to the work that will come out of his group in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's the end of the wonderful celebration. So Greg, come forward. You have no choice. And to say, you know, Greg is a great colleague. Uh, I think he's a great friend, and anybody who's worked with Greg knows his qualities, his talent, his humanity, and I can say much more, but of course I'll go a little bit wobbly on my words. So, so it is an absolute pleasure to have been given this chance to uh, welcome you and, give you, uh, and welcome you to this uh, inaugural lecture. So, so thank, thank you. you so much, Greg. Thank you all, and thank you those who, was, who are watching online, and uh, sorry I couldn't get to all the questions for all of you online too and let's go outside and celebrate properly, although we've done some celebration here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Super.